Gentlemen? Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for coming on a, on a Friday night, on a lovely summer night, when uh, I'm sure many people might be thinking of uh, sitting out at a cafe. So uh, please, I welcome you to come join us a little bit closer if you're interested. Uh, no, I, I can guarantee you that none of these gentlemen will bite. Uh, so please, uh, thank you very much if, you're, if you'd like to come down a little bit closer. We have the microphones, but... Uh, so anyway, um, welcome once again. My name is Chris Borelli. Uh, I'm from the Alumni Programs Office at the Marshall Center. You probably received your invitation to this event uh, from me or from someone that I, I asked uh, to, to invite you to. Uh, thanks once again for joining us. Uh, it may have been many years since you were at the Marshall Center, and I hope that this is an opportunity for you to put your, your thinking hat back on and perhaps engage in some kind of interesting discussion uh, that you may have had when you were there and possibly haven't had since. So uh, this evening we're very fortunate uh, for a number of things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, the University of Warsaw and especially the Warsaw East European uh, Conference for allowing us to be part of this event. Good afternoon, sir. Good to see you again. Come on in. <laughs> Uh, this is the, the second year now that uh, we've had a, a wonderful partnership with this event and uh, it's a natural connection and we really appreciate this and uh, it's a, a wonderful location and they've been gracious hosts. So this evening we have uh, an interesting program uh, for you. Uh, the title of it I hope was something that would attract a little bit of attention. Poland's relationships with the uh, United States, Germany and Russia. And we actually have some authorities who can speak on this topic tonight. Uh, instead of having uh, someone else, uh, we actually have uh, people from these countries and who can provide some, some very interesting uh, insight. For those of you who don't know, uh, here we have uh, Dr. Matt Rhodes. Professor Rhodes has been at the Marshall Center for many, many years. He's the director of our Southeast Europe program. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for, for uh, joining us here. Uh, professor Dr. Ralph Roloff is the, uh, the Deputy Dean and Senior German Professor at the Marshall Center. Thank you very much, Ralph. And uh, Professor Igor Zevalev, uh, Professor of National Security Studies at the Marshall Center, uh, who has recently returned to the Marshall Center. So thank you very much, uh, Igor, for, for being part of this. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Matt here in just a minute uh, to get on with the main program, but I want to give you a little idea. So. The topic tonight is uh, Poland's relations with USA, Germany, and Russia. Each of them is going to say a few words on that topic, uh, and then we invite you to engage in uh, questions and answers. If you ever wanted to have a chance to, to drill down on a particular topic, this is a great uh, panel for you to do so. And then following that, I'm going to give a little update as far as what's going on back in Garmisch. Like I said, it may have been uh, some time since you were there, it may have been a year, or it may have been, I think in some cases, uh, maybe 15 years since some of you have been there. Uh, and, uh, and so, a little chance to, to catch up on what's going on back there. And then we'll have a little reception afterwards, which I like to think of as the real reason why we're getting together here today, a chance to network and to meet fellow alumni and, and other professionals in the interesting uh, security field. So, that having been said, I'll turn it over to Matt. Uh, and you can sort of uh, introduce the topic and then take it from there. So, thank you. No, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, again, glad to see all of you and uh, nice that we have the opportunity with the East European Conference to, to also have a, a special session with Marshall Center alumni. Um, again, I would, would maybe just build on what Chris has already said, that he has, has been very generous to the, the three of us, uh, emphasizing that we can, can speak from direct experience uh, about our, the three countries where we come from and in terms of their relations with, with Poland. Uh, but I think it would be, of course, uh, irresponsible for us to, to have a program that, from your perspective, was uh, Onas Besnas. Uh, that we certainly want uh, also the, the Polish perspective very much in the bilateral respective uh, relationships to be, be reflected in your comments and in your questions. So we, we see our remarks as the, the start of the conversation, but, but not the end. 
Uh, as, as Chris mentioned, each of us will, will try to structure our remarks with a, a little bit about general context um, in, the, in the bilateral relationship, uh, a little bit focused on recent and current relations, both where there have been areas of, of progress or achievements and in areas where there may be some, some challenges or, or tensions, and, and then to offer a little bit as well about the perspective on the, the way ahead. And uh, I will start with the, the United States. And while you could say a lot uh, about general perspective, there, there's a very rich and long history of, of the relationship, uh, I'll just focus on some of maybe the, the best known issues. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, the celebration of independence that, uh, that Poland is experiencing this year, the, the 100 years, and this is also the theme of the, the overall conference. Uh, here's also a, a connection with the United States in that it was the American president, Woodrow Wilson, and his 14 points at the end of the First World War uh, that diplomatically helped open the way for, for Polish independence. Uh, but of course, from the, the opposite direction, uh, Americans are probably less good about remembering the assistance that some famous Poles offered to us in the 18th century when we were working for our independence from, from the United Kingdom. Uh, but Tadeusz Kaszkuszku and uh, Kazimierz Pulaski are, are also people who should be recognized as, as part of this, this long-term uh, bilateral relations. And besides the, the kind of famous people and, and uh, milestone events in history, from the American perspective, just the fact that there are, are millions of people of, of Polish descent, um, you know, millions of Polish immigrants who came to the United States through its history, including my, my wife's grandparents in 1915, is, is something that, uh, that is a bond between the, the two countries. If we, if we jump forward a little bit, at least to the, the post-Cold War era, uh, Poland has famously been viewed by many in the United States as what uh, former Secretary of Defense uh, Donald Rumsfeld termed New Europe, as a, a special partner in, in Europe for, for different reasons. And if we kind of interpret that understanding or concept fairly broadly, it could probably also ap apply during the 1990s, uh, during the uh, years when the Clinton administration was uh, encouraging the admission of Poland and others to, to NATO. It, it certainly applied in the, the first decade of this century when there was very strong Polish diplomatic and military support for the, the American involvement um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and so I think that carries over to a certain extent today as well. But, uh, but I'll try to focus my remarks now on where have we been in, in particular in the last 18 months under the Trump administration? Uh, what have been the, the major new developments in both military and political terms that are characterizing the, the bilateral relations? And if we start with the, the military side, uh, I think I, I know many of you are, are actually working on, on those issues on, on a daily basis, so you're, you're very much familiar with these. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the, the military relation has, has gotten in some ways uh, even closer than it was perhaps uh, during these deployments, big deployments to Iraq and, and Afghanistan. It's, Poland is still cooperating with the United States in some of the international missions like, um, like now uh, uh, Afghanistan, but you also now have this larger, more systematic and almost institutionalized American presence here in, in Poland. That with the, the decision by NATO to have the enhanced forward presence and the 800 uh, US soldiers who are part of the US-led uh, NATO battle group, uh, supplemented as well by the additional brigade, armored brigade combat team and the roughly 4,000 soldiers of, from the U.S. that are now here on uh, so-called toe-to-toe, uh, nine-month uh, rotations, uh, you have a, a kind of newly robust uh, American military presence here. Um, you also have an ongoing and perhaps deepening cooperation, of course, in the area of missile defense. Uh, one of the big highlights or our, our headlines of, of the spring was the finalization of Poland's decision to purchase uh, two Patriot air defense batteries from the United States uh, for a, a price of about almost $5 billion. So this is the, the biggest procurement uh, project in, in Polish history. 
And uh, in a slightly longer term, there's now the postponed uh, plans for the United States to develop also a, a segment of its own kind of NATO-linked uh, long-range missile defense system uh, probably by 2020 here in, in Poland. So, so this will be a, a, a further kind of reinforcement of, of American presence and in cooperation with, with Poland. Uh, there is also on the table, as, as many of you have been, been following, the, the offer by the Polish Ministry of Defense to make these rotational deployments permanent to, to establish full kind of German-style uh, uh, American bases here in, in the country with an offer of, of up to $2 billion of support to, to make that a, a reality. Uh, we discussed this a little bit in the, the previous panel, but as I, as I said then, there's kind of mixed views from my understanding in Washington, that there, there is some interest among political officials in the White House and, and some representatives in Congress in exploring this, this idea. Uh, to see if it would be a, a further sign of the solidarity between the two countries, a, a further sign of the seriousness of the, the defense and deterrence of, of a NATO ally. Uh, but most of the, of the kind of military professionals that I have talked to are, are a bit more cautious or, or skeptical. Uh, they say that there's maybe not a lot of additional military uh, advantage of having a, a technically permanent base rather than a, a persistently rotational one. Uh, they're cognizant that this would be a controversial issue among other NATO allies at a time when there are lots of other controversies within the alliance. And they have said that there are other places from a military perspective that they would like to see Poland uh, potentially spend uh, the money it's offering for an American base including further reinforcement in, in things like missile defense, uh, intelligence and surveillance, and in other areas. So it will be interesting to see how, how that particular aspect of the military relationship evolves. In the meantime, on the political side, uh, I think there have also been some, some interesting developments. Uh, one, I think, is just did some of the, the choices that the Trump administration has made, especially within the, the U.S. State Department, for, for people who are very knowledgeable about Poland and are, have really been kind of advocates of, of Poland in American foreign policy making. Uh, one, again, that we talked about a lot in the, the first session is the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia, Wes Mitchell who previously was the, the longtime head of the Center for European Policy Analysis, the, the leading think tank within Washington focused on Central Europe, uh, and of which um, Ray Wojcik is the, the Warsaw office uh, chair. Uh, so it has a, a very direct presence here as well. Uh, but in addition to, to Wes Mitchell, there was also the appointment of, uh, of Wes Mitchell's sometime co-author, uh, Jakob Grigil, to be the head of, uh, of the Europe section of the State Department policy planning staff. Uh, so he had been a, a, another very strong, knowledgeable voice uh, for, for Poland at the, the top levels of, of decision making. A, another kind of thing I think that was discussed a little bit in the first session was the, the decision of President Trump to come to Warsaw last summer during the Three Seas Summit. Uh, to give a pair of, of speeches about how the, the focus of, in his view of American foreign policy should be on the defense of Western civilization. Uh, very much throughout this speech referring to developments in, in Polish history that he thought uh, reinforced this argument about the history of, of the West and why it needed to, uh, to stay together in the face of 21st century challenges. So, so that I think was a was a major uh, decision as well. He has not given so many speeches in, in other countries, but that choosing Poland for this high profile one was a, was a sign of interest. Uh, the, the one area where there has been, I think, some, some tension, and, and this won't come as, as any surprise to, to people here, has been the, the controversy over the, the law passed in Poland earlier this year, dealing with uh, statements linking uh, polls to involvement with the, the Holocaust in the, the 1940s. Uh, there was a very tough statement from the, the State Department after this released, expressing concern that this challenged both uh, freedom of speech and, in the words of the statement, the possibilities of effective partnership between the, the United States and, and Poland. 
Um, it has not been an officially announced as such, but there were some media reports that the reason there was not a direct meeting between President Duda and President Trump in the White House during President Duda's trip to the United States a month ago, uh, there were reports saying this was because of ongoing dissatisfaction with this specific piece of, of legislation. Um, now, just this week, the, uh, the, the lower house of, of parliament did pass an amended version of this, this legislation, uh, dropping the criminal penalties that were associated with this. There was a, a positive reaction from the, the State Department, but this remains, I think, one area that will be, be interesting to, to the further uh, relationship. Uh, but beyond these kind of specific things, perhaps the, the biggest issue in, in the bilateral relations will be how um, the broader transatlantic uh, relationship develops. I mean, how is, is Poland affected by the, the overall approach of, of the U.S. administration towards NATO, its relations on trade with the, the European Union and, and so forth? And so I think that is, is the, the big question of, of where within the, uh, the broader framework uh, these bilateral ties will go. So look forward to questions after uh, we hear about Germany and Russia. Yeah, th thank you very much, um, uh, Matt, for this um, you know, fascinating tour de raison about the uh, U.S.-Polish uh, relation. Uh, so the German-Polish uh, relations, uh, I would describe very in a very uh, short sentence, uh, it's very, very important and it's very, very difficult. Um, so it, it has been due to history, uh, uh, first of all, and, and uh, uh, secondly, <coughs> Uh, in, in, in both relations and uh, in both regards. And uh, one, uh, one German uh, essayist, one intellectual, Peter Bender, who used to live here in Vasa for many, many years during the 70s and 80s, uh, before he died in 2006, published an essay. And uh, he said, um, well, if we speak about uh, German-Polish relations, uh, it's, um, it's about normalization still. So that's what he took and, and said. Uh, in 1970, when the Germans and uh, the Polish government, the then Western German government, uh, signed uh, the first uh, treaty for the Ostpolitik, the Warsaw Treaty, he emphasized that, this, uh, that the official title of this uh, uh, treaty was, not, uh, was uh, the fundamentals for a normalization. So it was even not normalization, but the fundamentals to start a kind of normalization process, which then uh, has since uh, started. Uh, from a German uh, perspective, uh, Poland is the key actor in uh, uh, Central and Eastern um, uh, Europe in, in many regards. It's not just uh, for the European integration, but uh, for the larger uh, perspective. Um, in a bilateral on a bilateral uh, relationship, so we in 2016 celebrated the 25th anniversary of uh, the uh, Treaty of Good Neighborhood and Friendship, so which is the basis for the, uh, the German-Polish relationship, which established uh, a lot of cooperation uh, uh, mechanisms, including regular uh, meetings of the heads of state of government, uh, of ministers, uh, and so forth, so which established a routinely uh, a consultation mechanism, very similar to uh, the German-French uh, treaty, and uh, that indeed uh, is a, a very good, uh, a very good uh, fundament uh, for uh, exercising the uh, bilateral relationship. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, societal integration, I would say, if we take a look from the political level, maybe there are tensions, and I will come back to, uh, to that later, but if it comes to the economical level and to the societal level, I'm deeply impressed when I read the numbers of uh, a German-Polish uh, relationship. Uh, so in terms of economics, in terms of uh, societal exchange, in terms of... Uh, uh, personal relationships. So, uh, what I recently, what what I recently figured out, and it wasn't very much clear to me, is uh, that uh, the Polish uh, that uh, uh, the Polish uh, citizens in Germany are the second largest group of uh, non-Germans in Germany, uh, besides uh, 
Turkish the first, uh, Polish uh, so the second. So that in itself creates a, a huge uh, relationship. And uh, intermarriages, we once had a dean uh, at the college who said, how can we measure the uh, success of an academic institution? And then he said, count the number of marriages that get out of your institution. So that, that is an indicator. And if uh, we take this as an indicator of the state of the relationship between uh, Poland and Germany, then we can say that then we are really in a good shape, um, if, that's, uh, if that's a matter of uh, indicator. So uh, on a societal level, the, uh, uh, the uh, relationships between German, Germany and Poland uh, uh, um, since uh, at least the unification are developing pretty well uh, in, in terms of the uh, exchange. Um, in terms of integration, in terms of the integration where Germany supported very highly uh, the integration of Poland into the uh, EU and into NATO, with one exception, and that was certainly one of the biggest mistakes uh, of German politics in the last 25 years, uh, when you come to opening the labor market. So that was uh, where the politicians in Germany uh, pushed uh, for integrating Poland into the European Union with the exception of integrating it into the labor market due to uh, the uh, popu uh, popular vote in Germany which was against this. I thought that was a very weird uh, situation uh, then and I never understood uh, uh, how that came. But um, given, uh, given this uh, strong relationship economically and society, uh, there are certain misunderstandings, uh, certain mistrust in the meantime, I would say even besides from uh, the uh, strong and close uh, uh, consultation mechanisms between uh, Poland uh, and Germany, and that's uh, related to, um, let's say, three, uh, three elements. Uh, the one is migration, the second is the development of the Visegrad group, and the third is uh, what we call multi-speed Europe. So that's, uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, the points of uh, concern where divergencies between Germany and uh, Poland uh, occurred. So the, the first is uh, the migration uh, issue, which is, I don't know if it's really the big issue in, in Europe, but it's uh, made the big issue in Europe. I recently had a phone call of a nephew of mine who lives in a, uh, uh, close to the uh, uh, German-French border, and he gave me a phone call uh, and said, you are living in Bavaria. Tell me what's going on with your Bavarian politicians. Why are they making such a fuss out of migration? I'm living here close to the French border and I have the impression that Germany is overrun by uh, uh, people from uh, Northern Africa uh, uh, raping our women and uh, stealing out our shops. I can see this here. I have other problems. My main problem is uh, to find a place for my little kid in a kindergarten. My, place, my uh, problem is to find a decent uh, apartment that I can pay for. And my point is, and so he uh, added a couple of things. So um, what uh, that's brought to my attention is if the migration issue is really such a big issue or if it's just a kind of uh, a staged uh, issue. But nevertheless, uh, it, it's one of the big issues in uh, the European uh, context, and here certainly the, uh, 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 the position of uh, the German government under Angela Merkel and the position of the uh, Polish government is one of the big points of uh, concern, which in Germany is considered to be a lack of solidarity on the Polish side and uh, certainly not uh, understood uh, uh, why uh, the rejection by Poland and the other uh, Visegrad uh, countries to the um, decision of the European Union has taken place. So that's the reading in, in, in Germany of it. So this uh, was a kind of uh, irritation. The second uh, uh, irritation uh, comes with the uh, strengthening of the Visegrad uh, Four as a forum uh, to exercise uh, uh, influence within the context of the European Union, which is closely related uh, to uh, the question of the emergence of a multi-speed uh, Europe. Uh, which is due to the fact of the, and with Brexit even getting uh, worse, uh, with a, a two-speed Europe, those who are in the Eurozone are going to uh, deepen the European integration, uh, and those who are not in the Eurozone um, left behind or uh, uh, are not uh, any longer a part of the core center of Europe. So that's the one. Um, the other issue is uh, that this is not the, uh, let's say, the easy picture 
But uh, if it comes to other issues related to European integ uh, integration, uh, 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 Poland is a very important partner for Germany, in particular when it comes to security and defense. Um, so um, the uh, uh, Polish uh, commitment to the European uh, Security and Defense Union and these uh, uh, efforts in strengthening uh, the European, um, the European um, security and uh, defense uh, uh, policy are not just highly welcome, but uh, Poland is considered to be one of the really pushing uh, partners and uh, reliable partners in this uh, exercise. Uh, the other one uh, is uh, our uh, big neighbor to uh, the West Fronts, and that brings me to this uh, trilateral relationship uh, which uh, 25 years ago was founded in this Weimar Triangle. Uh, the Weimar Triangle, uh, which is very often uh, brought back to, um, to the discussion to be revived and revitalized as a, a really, uh, a really uh, possible uh, powerhouse for initiatives and new initiatives in the European integration. My reading on the Weimar Triangle is uh, less ambitious. I would say the initial idea for the Weimar Triangle has been to bring Poland closer into the European integration uh, process and closer uh, to, uh, to uh, key uh, powers in uh, the European Union. And once it was in, then uh, at least uh, two partners of this triangle lost a little bit of enthusiasm. Uh, so, and uh, that's uh, where I think uh, it is. Another issue where uh, Poland is a very uh, a highly appreciated partner uh, from a German perspective, in particular if it comes to the Eastern Partnership. When it comes to the Eastern Partnership um, in uh, Europe, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, uh, and others, uh, that's where uh, Poland uh, is considered to be uh, one of the key initiators, even in the European Union uh, in particular, to push this relationship uh, uh, further. And that's uh, where uh, Germany um, uh, highly uh, appreciates uh, the cooperation uh, with Poland. So what, what you see at the, uh, uh, in my description is it's not just uh, a good or bad and bad times and good times, but currently we are in a situation where are certain uh, issues of tension, uh, where are certain issues of uh, large fields of cooperation and ongoing cooperation. And, and I, I would say that's, that states to a certain extent a, a growing normalization. Yeah? Uh, in uh, the relationship. And uh, one final point has met, uh, touched on it, uh, the criticism on uh, internal issues going on in uh, Poland. Uh, the German uh, government, as many other EU member states, are highly criticizing not just uh, this law, but in particular uh, the justice reform in uh, uh, Poland that has taken place and that's now criticized by the European uh, Union. Uh, I consider this as a fact of normalization as well. Among members of the European uh, Union, uh, putting uh, the finger off uh, into uh, open wounds in uh, politically uh, things. Uh, this is nothing where we interfere into internal affairs, but that's basically what uh, the European, is, uh, European Union is about as, uh, as a, a kind of a more than an international um, organization. Um, the other two uh, items um, that I have here on my list uh, is the one is Russia and the other is uni the United States. So uh, what I saw in the um, uh, positions uh, or assessing my uh, assessment in the uh, positions of Germany and uh, Poland vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, I would say there's a, sto a strong uh, uh, convergence in uh, their positions regarding uh, uh, Russia. So and that. Um, uh, and that's uh, even due to the fact that I, I talked before about the Russian understanders and the German Ostpolitik, which is uh, heavily uh, directed uh, towards Russia, but not only towards Russia. And uh, here a common strong position uh, with uh, Russia after the uh, annexation of Crimea is something that uh, brought, uh, brought Poland and uh, Germany very close uh, together in this regard. So that's uh, certainly an issue. Uh, where we uh, achieved uh, more convergence. Uh, on the other side, uh, the uh, position with uh, the United States I met, uh, described uh, the uh, US-Polish uh, relation. Uh, I would say we had issues, yes, so the uh, strong support of uh, Poland for the United States on the one side 
uh, in particular after 2003. Um, where uh, Germany was not that supportive and uh, risked even uh, a lot of trouble together with uh, France uh, in the relationship when it came to the uh, uh, Iraqi uh, war. So that's, uh, that's an issue where we, uh, where we diverge. And uh, what I'm uh, seeing in the Trump administration, and I described it before uh, in the context of the NATO uh, summit, I see uh, new uh, divergences emerging. Uh, so uh, the United States is a very important uh, partner um, for, uh, for Poland and a guarantee of, a guarantee, uh, guarantor for its uh, security. But uh, in Germany we see it <coughs> slightly differently. And uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, the continuation of the uh, US, German, US, EU relationship, I, uh, I, I foresee that we then see a, a new uh, a divergence uh, emerging in the uh, Polish perspective on the Trump administration and how we should look like at it and uh, the German one of it. So taken together, I would say uh, yes, we are a, in a, a normalized situation. We are deeply integrated. We are uh, interdependent in the meantime. Uh, we have our issues. And that's uh, good. And we have our channels, how we can deal with them uh, and uh, how we can exercise uh, the uh, bilateral relationships. So with that, I hand it over to Igor and the Russian perspective. Thank you. There is no way to summarize the current state of Russian-Polish relations in 10 minutes. If Chris gave me 10 hours, it would be still too little, and he's not going to give me 10 hours, I guess. Uh, so I will make just two points. First, the current state of relations is, has reached an all-time low. And the question is why? I will offer you my take. And second, the relations between our two countries have had remarkable ups and downs during the last 25 years. And this gives us, or me at least, some hope. Uh, Ralph said that the relationship between Poland and Germany is very important and very difficult. The, very, uh, the relationship between Russia and Poland from a Russian perspective probably not that important, at least it is not existentially critical, there is some asymmetry in perception of each other in two countries, but extremely difficult. It's to put mildly. Uh, I remember how fascinated my friends and I were everything Polish when Perestroika and Glasnost started and reforms started in Eastern Europe. Uh, Adam Michnik name became a household name for many Russian intellectuals. And uh, for many reform-minded liberal Russians, Poland was a successful model of transformation from uh, command economy and uh, communist dictatorship to market economy and democracy. And Poland was viewed as a success story in the former Eastern Bloc. And Poland was seen, once again, among pro-Western liberals in Moscow, and there were many at that time, uh, probably in a rosy, you know, <laughs> it was portrayed as mo even more successful than it was really in real life uh, when all the difficulties uh, it faced, especially in the economic sphere. So in short, Russians viewed Poland as pillar and paragon of transition in Central and Eastern Europe. So, and the changes in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and of course in Poland even before that, uh, gave us an opportunity for reconciliation. Ralph uh, talked about normalization, but at least in Russia, the word reconciliation was used. And it looked in 
early 90s of the last century that this process gained momentum and the two countries finally managed to put to rest centuries of mutual grievances, and they're mutual, by the way. And the gradual reconciliation was a stri strategic decision aimed at changing the character of the relationship from uh, and to make it free from emotion and suspicion and back to pragmatism and cooperation on a new basis. And uh, approximately at, this, uh, at that time when the treaty between Germany and Poland was uh, signed and ratified, the same was about Polish-Russian um, uh, big treaty in 1992. Unfortunately, this rapprochement did not last long. And the prospect of NATO's enlargement soon overshadowed all other considerations about Poland in Russia. In 1999, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic joined NATO in spite of the Russian protestations. But it's interesting. Russians tended to put all the blame on Washington, not on Warsaw or Prague uh, or Budapest. Many Russians privately, including officials, and I heard it many times, by the way, acknowledged privately that if there were polls, of course they would seek member, uh, NATO membership. No question about that. They acknowledged that. that so, so they put all the blame on Washington that uh, actually drove NATO to uh, accept uh, Poland and uh, Czech Republic and Hungary into NATO. A new, but unfortunately very brief period in the relations between Russia and Poland was shaped by the Smolensk strategy on April 10th, uh, 2010. And during the weeks and months um, after the tragedy, ties between Moscow and Warsaw improved. Uh, and this was despite of all the theories swirling around already at that time. And days after crash, and it was a very uh, symbolic, President Putin himself actually gave a green light to air Andrzej Vida's uh, film Katyn on prime time on the first national channel. And that was the first time 99.99% .99 of Russians saw something about the Katyn uh, and new from this uh, movie. So the atmosphere was absolutely different from what it is uh, <clears throat> now. And today there is very little uh, in Polish-Russian uh, rapprochement remain. And the question is why? And the puzzle looks even more mystifying in a comparative context. Look at Russian relations with uh, other Central European countries with Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia. These countries have, from a Russian perspective, some similarities with Poland. Uh, they have historic memories of 1956 invasion of Hungary, of 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. So there are a lot of difficult, well, really difficult and tragic uh, pages of history between uh, Russia and these countries. These countries today, of course, honor their NATO commitments, uh, their solidarity within the European Union in terms of supporting sanctions against Russia, but they never try to add something to these uh, policies, uh, I mean something negative. Uh, they never go beyond what is required from them. On the contrary, they would prefer to ease sanctions today. So from my perspective, there are two reasons, probably, and maybe I'm wrong and you will suggest something completely opposite. There are two main reasons for the current dire state of Russian-Polish relations. First, it is the Ukrainian crisis, annexation of Crimea, and the ongoing conflict in Donbass and the resulting clash between Russia and the West. 
And Foreign Minister Chepotovich stated recently that the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is the most important reference point for Poland's security policy. And he added that Poland is the only European Union country that borders both the aggressor and the victim of the aggression. And that puts Poland in a particular situation which is different from other countries of the European Union and NATO. From my perspective, the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on the relations between Poland and Hungary absolutely necessary, but still not sufficient explanation of the dire state of affairs. And here we come to the second reason, and this is a very Russian perspective, uh, and of course you may have a different perspective here in Poland. Many people in Moscow believe that Russian-Poland relations have become, have become a factor in domestic politics in Warsaw since a decisive electoral victory of the Law and Justice Party in October 2015. Here I will digress for a moment and then come back to my main point. Many analysts today talk about the formation of a transnational trend, transnational anti-liberal trend. It is shaped by many different political actors in very different countries. Look at China, Russia, Turkey, Venezuela, Bolivia, Hungary, Poland, Italy, Brexit, the White House. President Trump promotes, from my perspective, an illiberal understanding of Western civilization. I do not put a necessarily negative, uh, a negative connotation to that. I'm just fixating. Uh, a year ago, uh, in this city, in July last year, he said uh, about Western civilization based on history, culture, and religion. May I talk about it? Instead of liberal understanding of values as the main characteristic of the Western civilization, it's a different interpretation of the Western civilization. So today we see some ideological affinity among very diverse, very di different political actors in very different parts of the world. And it's interesting to me, and I'm writing a book about, uh, well, the impact of ideas on Russian foreign policy, so I'm trying to see the impact of some ideas on everything. And uh, I see some affinity between some ideas promoted by the ideologues uh, close to the Kremlin and some parts of the law and justice program, uh, law and justice party program. And however, in spite of this ideational affinity to some extent, Russia-Poland relations prove that it's not enough for good relationship. And national identity, history, and geography, or rather politically motivated interpretation of national identity, uh, history, and geography, trump ideological and ideational affinity. So it looks nevertheless that the new generation of Russians and Poles is very different. They are less interested in what I am interested in, in the realm of ideas. And Robert Lewandowski is better known in Russia today than Adam Michnik. And uh, many Russian football players, uh, fans, were really disappointed that Poland's World Cup ended. And I hope that the new generation of Russians and Poles will finally find common language and look for what is common and what is, uh, doesn't separate them. So I'm guardedly optimistic, but very guardedly. Thank you very much. 
All right, well, uh, that's three views as promised, but now it's, it's your turn for some comments and, and questions. I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, what you have to say. I have a mic here if anyone uh, is interested in question. Okay, professors, thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, stimulating speeches. Uh, now, first of all, let me address uh, let me address uh, Professor um, Zevelev what what he said. Uh, I mean, considering the relations between Poland and Germany, the state of this relation, I cannot agree with you that it required a long time to describe it. It's a career one sentence to describe it. They are bad, just simple as this is. And uh, when it comes to it, why? they are bad, I think there is another s quite simple answer. Uh, you mentioned ups and downs in our relations. Yes, there were some ups, there were some downs, but uh, what's all about, I think, is that uh, each time Russian Federation become more and more democratic country, then the relations get better and better. And each, ta each time, you have some, let's say it's like issues with democratic rules, then the relations get worse and worse, and that's a very easy mechanism. Russia can be very important partner for Poland, but can be a very important threat for a country as well. More democratic, more important partner. Less democratic, a threat. And that's as easy as it is. And NATO, European Union, institutions like that keeps our country safe in the face of uh, this uh, huge difference in, in the power between Russia and, and Poland. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to uh, what Professor Rolf uh, mentioned about the relations between Poland and, and Germany, uh, I think that the dialogue between Warsaw and Berlin is very important and the more dialogue we have, the better we can understand each other and better we can cooperate and I'm very happy that Marshall Center, Center is here and we can have uh, uh, this kind of meetings and discussions. It's very enriching always and thank you very much for coming to Poland. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond in particular or? Uh May I thank you very much for the thoughts you sh shared with us. And basically, I mostly agree with what you said. H having said that, I would add that uh, I do not buy this idea that democracies never fight each other easily. You know, I need to have more evidence of that and more evidence to the contrary that democracies and non-democracies necessarily fight each other. And it's not the case from my perspective. Uh, a few days ago, a controversial author gave a talk at uh, the Marshall Center. And he once uh, authored a book under the title of Friendly Tyrants. And that was a book written about American allies who are tyrants, as he wrote, but trusted a long time American allies. So there are some exceptions, but basically I agree with your main thrust, especially in case of Russia, if it is more democratic, the relationship between Russia and the West in general, and as a consequence between Russia and Poland in particular, uh, well, will improve. Absolutely. Uh, we're not moving into that direction now. If I may, um, as, as you mentioned, the mobility uh, aspect in the exchange of, uh, um, of um, uh, societies, I, I mean, that's, that's absolute uh, key. I think that's why I described so broadly the uh, societal uh, relationship. I mean, if it comes to, uh, to prejudices, uh, it's very easy to joke about Poland uh, in, in Germany and the other way around and uh, 
to serve all the prejudices and to misuse them in, in internal uh, political uh, discussions for whatever political uh, reason. But uh, if we if we really uh, manage to, to, to still keep up the high level of interactivity, uh, societal, starting with the uh, German-Polish uh, Youth uh, uh, Foundation with exchanging two million back and forth, uh, uh, continuing with uh, uh, this kind of cross-border activities, not on the state level, but on the uh, uh, lower regional level, where you really have a day-to-day -day interactivity. Uh, so that, that certainly helps to keep our societies open and open-minded. I mean, it, it's not just uh, that we are currently in a fight for the open society globally and on, on national level levels. Uh, I think it's very much related to open-mindedness. Uh, so, and, and, and this kind of... Uh, societal activities. Sometimes they sound really crazy and silly, but uh, I think that's what, what, what finally matters and what we, from uh, the strategic level of, uh, uh, that we discuss very often issues, uh, are not take too much into uh, consideration. And, and, and the same is true uh, uh, for uh, the relations with Americans and, and Russians. So if we don't uh, uh, keep an eye on this, uh, uh, then we certainly are lost in the spiral of uh, the populists all over the places. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Ovidiu Dranga, Ambassador of Romania to Poland. Let me first thank all panelists for their excellent uh, presentations. I would have a comment and then a question for all of, all of you, if I may. Uh, first, uh, uh, Poland uh, belongs to a very important region for uh, the European Union and NATO, the Central Europe. Uh, and the situation in Central Europe has changed uh, over time for the better, I would say, economically, politically, and from a security point of view, because Central Europe now belongs to the Euro-Atlantic uh, family. <coughs> um, my, my question would be, um, uh, well, related to the fact that Poland, together with other countries, Romania in particular, has developed a certain uh, level of uh, political activism in, in the region, and has initiated to, uh, alone or together with other countries um, cooperation schemes that are uh, very important, I would say, for the European Union and NATO uh, as a whole. I'm speaking now about the Three Cs initiative and the B9, the Bucharest 9 format, both uh, uh, at the initiative uh, of, of Poland and countries in this, in this region. And how is this perceived in, uh, well, uh, uh, in the US, in, in Germany and Russia? I mean, is, it, is Poland's uh, uh, activism a threat to the unity of the alliance or the European Union, uh, to put it this way? Or is it an asset? Uh, uh, is it uh, something that should be, one should be afraid of or on the contrary, something that should be encouraged? In the sense that uh, <coughs> Poland's uh, initiatives together with other countries, I, I, I underline this, are actually in the benefit of uh, the security and the prosperity of the European Union and NATO in general. This is my point of view. Thank you. Okay, well maybe I'll, I'll start and we'll, we'll work our way down. Um, I, I think in general the United States has, has supported uh, regional frameworks, even going back to the, the Visegrad group in the, in the 1990s. Um, but again, they've been kind of wanting them to be working towards support of these broader frameworks, especially of, of NATO in the case of, of the United States. Uh, and, and most recently with the, the Bucharest 9, a, a sense that it has had some, some positive initiatives, in, including uh, before the Warsaw Summit, uh, shaping what has, has become the, the enhanced forward presence. Uh, but there was also, again, a concern that uh, those kind of uh, desires for a, a, a you know, boots on the ground kind of presence by NATO prior to Warsaw be expressed in a way that was um, not seen as kind of an ultimatum to, to the rest of, of NATO, that it was not seen as, as, as divisive. So um, people like Sandy Verspau, although he wasn't the, a US official, he was a you know, deputy uh, secretary general of, of NATO, uh, worked with the Bucharest Dine to shape how they, they presented their, uh, their, their statement after some of their, their meetings. So I, I think the idea of, of these as a, a source of an ideas as a, as a kind of a regional caucus with uh, specific perspectives and, uh, and experiences is seen as, as positive. Uh, but I think there would be at least skepticism about it, uh, seeing as something we want to have a, for example, a Bucharest 9 alliance uh, separate from, from, from NATO, that that would be seen as neither positive nor, nor perhaps uh, especially effective. 
So if I may, uh, I recently had a discussion with a very good friend of mine um, uh, exactly on this, uh, um, on this question. So, um, and uh, he pushed me and said, well, you Germans, you need to do something. You need to talk to the, uh, to the Polish government. You need to talk uh, to the Czech government. Your chancellor need to travel here and to Trier because otherwise uh, these countries are driving apart from. You know? So they, they are gathering together in the Visegrad group and, and then they take the others and that's will put the wedges into uh, the European Union. And then you have two-speed Europe and uh, then we are far away from and, uh, and then I mentioned, but wait a moment, wait a moment, you, we do have these initiatives, uh, but we do not consider them in this kind of zero-sum game, and we certainly do not see them as a kind of opposition to, uh, but uh, the other way around. We, uh, we think that this kind of uh, uh, cooperation among these countries is a, a greater set for, uh, the larger, uh, for, uh, for the larger European Union and even for the transatlantic relationship. Because what you can do in this kind of cooperation and with this perspective, you bring the knowledge from the region and for the region. I mean, that was uh, why Germany so uh, highly uh, was happy about the initiative that uh, Poland uh, took a couple of years with this Eastern Partnership Initiative. I always said, okay, so, uh, the French came up with this great idea to have the Mediterranean Union, yeah, so, and then uh, Poland and Sweden came up with the idea of having the Eastern Partnership. But taking this kind of responsibility and, 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 and activity, that shows that, uh, uh, that this is uh, a really a set for the European Union where we can uh, rely on your knowledge and your uh, activity. So um, I, I don't see this as a, a kind of concern or even this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, fire and fury stuff, yeah? so uh, splitting uh, Europe, but this is, I think, uh, a greater set. A perspective from Moscow as far as uh, I see it. Uh, Polish regional activism, as you formulated that, uh, is seen differently by different actors in Moscow. Uh, Nevertheless, there is almost a consensus that Poland punches above its weight. And from, in a sense, it's like Russia playing a not very strong hand, but it looks like it's very strong and influential. This is, once again, it's not, it's a widespread perception and uh, just related. Uh, the ideologues in Moscow see some old imper imperial ambitions, actually, regional imperial ambitions of Poland. Uh, and from their perspective, uh, well, Poland sees Belarus and Ukraine in particular as a zone of uh, its historic cultural civilizational influence. So it is seen very negatively. Pragmatics, well, more foreign policy and security types actually do not see it negatively because sometimes this activism uh, borders something that may be viewed at least from Moscow, is divisive within uh, the Western alliance. And from that perspective, it's good to Moscow. John, you were next. Thank you. I think I'm probably going to be the last person because we're almost out of time. Uh, I wanted to mention something that um, occurred to me as, as we were talking about asymmetry. Uh, in 1967, uh, the Polish bishops sent a letter to the uh, Catholic bishops of Germany, uh, starting a process that culminated in Willy Brandt coming to Warsaw and kneeling in front of the uh, monument uh, to the fighters of the, uh, the ghetto. Uh, and that started uh, a, a series of discussions between uh, what was then still West Germany and the Polish People's Republic, which turned out to be a very good thing for Poland and probably not a bad thing for West Germany either. Nothing like that has happened uh, in the Polish-Russian relationship. So holding on to the remnants of that uh, Tupolev, uh, the plane that crashed in Smolensk, 
uh, is actually a very logical step on the part of Mr. Putin. Why? Because if he made a gesture like that and, and said, look, let's give them the wreck. Let's, let's send them that as a present. We'll make a statement. I'll come to Warsaw. He obviously is not going to kneel anywhere, but, but he'll make a gesture. If he were to do that, this government of law and justice would get a big boost because they would be seen as having somehow impacted the thinking of Mr. Putin. Now, regardless of how the Polish-Russian relationship uh, would develop after that, chances are that in Polish politics, uh, law and justice would get a big boost, and it's probably not logical to imagine that they would change the way that they do business internationally. So, if anything, the tendency to to punch above their weight would continue. I'm guessing that the ideologues, as you call them in Moscow, have already figured this out, and that's the reason why that plane is going to stay where it is uh, near Smolensk, and why there's not going to be any kind of traction between uh, Mr. Putin and uh, the law and justice government here, which means effectively that the relationship between Poland and Russia will remain as it is now, which is nowhere. It's not, it's not a, a great way to end a session on uh, Poland's relationships with USA, Germany, and Russia, but I think that's the logical conclusion uh, to make, and I don't think that uh, the Russian Federation is going to change its mind. Thank you very much. So when, when your host drops the hint that uh, you, <laughs> might be, you might be reaching the edge of your time, um, I'm gonna take that hint. But I first want to give uh, Igor a chance to reply to if he has any comments on that. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, on a very idealistic note, and the idealistic note would be that the policymakers in uh, our two countries should keep in mind that sometimes public perception, citizens' perception of some policy moves is even more important than domestic politics. And unfortunately, well, our leaders do not always uh, keep that in mind because there is a great potential between society to society, links and conversations and dialogues and exchanges between Poland and Russia, uh, which is not used at all. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all very much. I just, uh, I know there were a few other questions out there. Uh, I just ask that uh, when we break, please feel free to come up and, uh, and engage any of our panelists. I'm sure they're very, very happy to, to answer your questions. Um, with an eye on the clock, I, uh, I do wanna take just a, a few more moments of your time now and, uh, and give you a little bit of a, an update as far as what's happening uh, back in Garmisch. Yeah, if you don't wanna crane your neck, but you've seen it already, right? <laughs> So, um, I already introduced myself and uh, my purpose now is to, to let you know what's going on in Garmisch and to let you know also what some of the ongoing opportunities are for alumni and uh, the resources that are there uh, that we make available to you so that you can stay engaged in this, in this uh, wonderful network that we have. So I know it was uh, almost 30 degrees here today in uh, Warsaw. This was uh, this morning when we left. No, I'm, I'm just joking, of course. Uh, I don't know uh, when it was that you were in Garmisch. Perhaps it was the winter time. Uh, perhaps it was the summer time. Maybe you transitioned. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that it is as lovely as ever uh, in Garmisch. Uh, actually, it's been pretty warm. Uh, well, we had a little cold spell, but it's, uh, that's all green today, by the way. It's not white. Um, 